name's Molly and I'm a senior writer for the online science publication Technology Networks. Welcome to Teach Me in 10, our video series that invites scientists to be our guest and talk us through a scientific research area or a scientific concept in less than 10 minutes. We want to make science as accessible as possible for you. My guest today for this episode of Teach Me in 10 is Professor Andrew Zidney. Professor Zidney is a distinguished professor of chemical engineering at Pennsylvania State University. He's going to be talking to us about biopharmaceuticals. What are they? How are they made? And how can they be used to treat certain diseases? I'll hand it over to you, Professor Zidney. Thank you for the very kind introduction. It's my pleasure today to talk to you about biopharmaceuticals. Biopharmaceuticals are drugs that are produced biologically instead of by traditional synthetic organic chemistry. Biopharmaceuticals are often referred to as biologics or simply as biological products, and they are often produced using modern methods of biotechnology, for example, cloning and recombinant DNA technology. There are a number of biopharmaceuticals that are used in the treatment of disease. These include natural protein products, primarily hormones and clotting factors. All of you are familiar with insulin, which is used in the treatment of diabetes. Insulin was originally obtained from the pancreas of animals, primarily cows and pigs. But today we produce insulin using recombinant DNA technology. In fact, insulin was the first biopharmaceutical that was produced using modern techniques of molecular biology. Factor VIII is a clinical blood clotting factor that can be used in the treatment of hemophilia. Factor VIII was originally obtained from donated human plasma, although again today, factor VIII is produced almost entirely by recombinant DNA technology. In addition to natural protein products, there are a number of engineered proteins that are also used as biopharmaceuticals, most of which are monoclonal antibodies or antibody-related products. This includes a number of cancer therapeutics like Herceptin, which is specifically designed to bind to the human epidermal growth factor receptor 2 that is overexpressed on the surface of many breast cancer cells. Humira can be used to reduce the inflammatory response, and it is currently applied in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, as well as Crohn's disease. More recently, there has been growing interest in the development of biopharmaceuticals based on nucleic acids, viruses, or even whole cells. The COVID-19 vaccines that were developed last year are largely based on the delivery of messenger RNA, which codes for the spike protein. This allows the body's own cells to produce the spike protein and generate an immune response that will ultimately provide protection against subsequent infection by the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Now, in order to understand the place of biopharmaceuticals, it's very helpful to look at the central dogma of biology. DNA contains all of ge genetic information in all animals and plants, as well as microorganisms. The DNA is transcribed into messenger RNA, which is then translated into proteins. This includes enzymes, hormones, as well as structural proteins and signaling proteins and receptors. Most proteins function through their action on or with small molecules. Some enzymes produce a variety of small molecules. Many vitamins are cofactors on enzymes. The pharmaceutical industry began by focusing on the production of small molecules that would interact with proteins. This included amino acids, vitamins, hormones, neurotransmitters, as well as a variety of other pharmaceutical products. The biopharmaceutical industry has moved up this chain of cent the central dogma of biology. Initially, the focus was on the development of proteins, and in particular, through the use of cloning and recombinant DNA technology through the production of recombinant therapeutics. 
The first of these to be commercialized was insulin, which was developed in the late 1970s and commercialized in the early 1980s. Today, there's growing interest in moving further upstream through the development of biopharmaceuticals that are based on either DNA or RNA. Now, it's helpful to look at an example of a small molecule pharmaceutical to contrast that with a biopharmaceutical. And I've shown here the final step in the production of aspirin or acetyl salicylic acid through the reaction of salicylic acid and acetic anhydride. This is traditional synthetic organic chemistry, and it leads to the production of acetyl salicylic acid which is a relatively small molecule containing a benzene ring, a total of nine carbon atoms, eight hydrogen atoms, and four oxygen atoms. The biological functions of aspirin are quite complicated, but many of these involve the inactivation of cyclooxygenase, a critical enzyme which is involved in the synthesis of prostaglandin and thromboxane. Aspirin is a relatively inexpensive molecule with a cost of about 20 cents per gram. Now, in contrast, this is an image of the molecules or the atoms that make up Herceptin, a monoclonal antibody. Herceptin contains 6,470 carbon atoms, more than 10,000 hydrogens, more than 1,700 nitrogens, 2,000 oxygens, and 42 sulfur atoms. It is a very specific antibody whose three-dimensional structure allows it to bind to the human epidermal growth factor receptor 2 that is expressed on the surface of many breast cancer cells. When Herceptin binds to that receptor, it blocks the activation of that uh, cell uh, and inhibits the division of that cell and the spread of the tumor. In contrast to aspirin, which runs about 20 cents per gram, Herceptin currently costs about $15,000 per gram. Now, biopharmaceuticals have become a critical component of the overall drug production industry. If we look at the top 15 selling drugs around the world, 10 of these are biopharmaceuticals, and the large majority of those are monoclonal antibodies, with Humira adalimumab having more than $20 billion of annual sales every year. Monoclonal antibodies uh, currently have total annual sales in excess of $120 billion. More than 100 monoclonal antibodies have been approved by the Food and Drug Administration for use in the United States. These are primarily cancer therapeutics, but they also include antibodies that are designed to treat autoimmune diseases, infectious diseases, and inflammatory diseases. There were several monoclonal antibody products that were developed last year specifically for the treatment of COVID-19. In this case, those antibodies had a three-dimensional structure that allowed them to bind to the spike protein on the surface of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. When those antibodies bind to the virus, they block its ability to enter the cells and help the patient clear those viruses from the circulation. Now, one of the reasons that biopharmaceuticals are so much more expensive than small molecules pharmaceuticals is they're produced by a biological process instead of by synthetic organic chemistry. In most cases, this involves using a genetically engineered cell line. Insulin is typically cloned into bacteria like E. coli. Perceptin is actually produced in a mammalian cell line known as Chinese hamster ovary cells. These products are all injectable because they would be degraded by our gastrointestinal tract. Thus means that they have to be produced with incredibly high levels of purity, less than one virus per million doses and absolutely zero bacteria. 
In addition, these complex molecules are sensitive to heat, solvents, and extremes of pH. Thus, they require specially designed purification methods, and the process is currently dominated by chromatography and membrane separations. This is a process flow diagram for the production of a typical monoclonal antibody. The left side shows the upstream or cell culture part of the process, beginning with a small inoculum and then moving up to a 20,000 liter bioreactor. The right-hand side shows the downstream of purification process, which includes a variety of chromatography steps like protein A affinity chromatography, ion exchange chromatography and hydrophobic interaction chromatography, as well as a variety of membrane steps, many of which are specifically designed to remove viruses and bacteria that could ultimately contaminate the final product. I hope you've enjoyed and learned something from this discussion of biopharmaceuticals. Uh, it's been, been my pleasure to get a chance to talk with you today. Thank you very much. Here at Teach Me in 10, we'd like to say a huge thank you to Professor Zidney for joining us and teaching us all about biopharmaceuticals in less than 10 minutes. If you'd like to learn more, then you can check out the links listed below in the video description for further reading on biopharmaceuticals. We'll be back next week for another episode of Teach Me in 10. If you can't wait until then, be sure to check out our LabTube channel where you can find all of the Teach Me in 10 videos that we have published so far. A huge thanks to Professor Zidney and we'll see you next week.